Hello students. Today we are going to see another topic called lumbar spondylosis. In the previous class we have seen about the cervical spondylosis. So it's the same kind of uh, pathology which is caused by degenerative changes in the structures of the vertebral column, the disc, the ligaments. But uh, this is after the common part was the cervical region in spondylosis, and the next common was uh, is the lumbar area. So let's see uh, in details what is lumbar spondylosis. So here uh, again, this picture uh, I am again repeating here. You can see the vertebral column and the structures and normal disc here. It degenerated disc bulging disc here the bulge herniated disc already the nucleus has come upper pussis has come out and it is trying to compress the structures here a thinning disc where because of degeneration and the, the water imbibing capacity reduction the disc has lost its height and it has become thinned and here you can see the disc is thin and also the vertebral body margins are irregular in shape and with bony projections and spurs which are called the osteophytes so uh, it is described as the degenerative conditions affecting the disc vertebral bodies and the joints of the lumbar vertebrae and uh, age trauma then the daily use of the intervertebral disc vertebra and associated joints that is the repetitive daily activities uh, is thought to be responsible as we have seen same in the cervical spondylosis so here when a patient suffers from lumbar spondylosis it is possible that again the osteophytes are the main region and these osteophytes are formed when there is the erosion of the bony surfaces and the underlying uh, bone is exposed the subchondral bone and then there will be patches of the subchondral bone exposed which are called as abernation and ultimately the subchondral bone is exposed there will be pain and uh, there will be the initiation of new bone formations and uh, which will become developed like these bony projections or spurs known as the osteophytes so the patient can experience joint stiffness that is a limited range of motion then have also they may have or exhibit neurologic claudication claudication we have seen in a classical symptom in the spinal stenosis so ultimately when there is the uh, spondylosis with all the degenerative changes these changes ultimately the structures will uh, sometimes tend to narrow the spinal canal and this claudication pain will be exhibited with lower back pain numbness well, standing and walking this is one picture showing the different angles of the lumbar vertebras this is the lateral view the ap view the posterior view you can see the vertebral body shapes the transverse processes and the articular processes the spinous processes and these are the transverse processes on the both the sides superior and inferior articular facets this is the posterior part this is the spinous process and you can see some of the individual vertebras shown here so that means again yes degeneration of the lumbar spine is the most responsible factor for spondylosis and it starts or initiates from the intervertebral disc at this level progressive biochemical and structural changes takes place leading to a modification in the physical properties of elasticity and mechanical resistance the disc lesions causes pathological changes in the vertebral bodies where the osteophytes will appear and most of them appear like anteriorly or in the lateral projection. Posteriorly, they are less common and rarely impinge on the spinal cord or nerve roots. Here you can see this is the x-ray picture of an x-ray of AP view of lumbar spine, the vertical overgrowths from the margins of the vertebral bodies represents the osteophytes.
the risk factors if we summarize or if we want to point out is first is the aging as i told you with age structures on repeated activities they go for degeneration obesity uh, excessive weight and uh, excessive loading on the vertebra the ligaments laxity the muscles are uh, stretched and become loose uh, giving more load on the vertebral column the core strength the core muscle goes for weakness sedentary lifestyle yes definitely abdominal muscle weakness as i said psychological uh, distress occupational prolonged sitting or standing occupational hazards like uh, the uh, long sitting jobs in the in the banking sector or the corporate sectors the office workers heavy weight lifting twisting even for the uh, long standing uh, surgery is done by the surgeons then the previous injury to the low back poor posture inappropriate posture for activity being performed if the posture is not good if the person has developed a habit of poor posture ultimately the load distribution will be affected and some of the components will be uh, actively participating some load will be not there in not uniform uh, load distribution ultimately those areas will be again be uh, prone for the early regeneration then these congenital abnormalities in the spine and uh, smoking smoking is also in in some studies it is said that uh, there is uh, nothing much of effect but in some studies yes it is saying that smoking is also a responsible factor for early degeneration or disc changes or the losing of the water content of the disc or the dehydration of the disc now these phases of degeneration this whole process of degeneration we can um, try to divide into three phases the phase one is the dysfunction phase where there is a repetitive microtrauma painful tears of outer innervated annulus fibrosis and associated end plate separation this compromises the disc's nutritional supply and waste removal resulting in dehydration and loss of disc height the second phase is the instability where it is characterized by loss of mechanical stability disc changes of resorption internal disruption additional annular tears further facet degeneration all resulting in subluxation and instability the third phase is uh, called the stabilization phase where the discs almost they uh, narrows up and the fibrosis takes place lots of osteophyte formation and the transdiscal bridging as we can see in this x-ray here the arrows showing the uh, abnormal bone margins of the vertebras and the irregular surfaces the pointed osteophytes and if we talk about the epidemiology it is a form of lower back pain and is very important clinically socio economically and public health problem affecting the worldwide population so there are some uh, kind of statistics according to the studies then these statistics say that the incidence is 27 to 37% of asymptomatic low back pain we find lumbar spondylosis in the us we can see that 80% of individuals older than 40 uh, have lumbar spondylosis and increasing from 3% of individuals aged 20 to 29 Approximately 84% of men, 74% of women have vertebral osteophytes, most frequently T9 to T10 and then at L3 levels. We can see approximately 30% of men and 28% of women aged 55 to 64 have lumbar osteophytes and 20% of men and 22% of women aged between 45 to 64 have lumbar osteophytes and both the sex are equally uh, and most equal and it can also begin in as young as 20 years it increases with uh, perhaps in inevitable concomitant of the old age uh, most studies and the uh, most international studies suggest that sometimes uh, these studies say that there is no relation to lifestyle height weight body mass physical activity cigarettes and alcohol consumption but again there are many studies which are proving that yes lifestyle sedentary lifestyle obesity overweight these have a direct impact on the on the load distribution and early degeneration uh, the effects of heavy physical activity are controversial in purported relation to disc degeneration uh, 
Muraki et al. did a cross-sectional study in large populations which revealed the high prevalence of radiographic lumbar spondylosis in elderly subjects. And gender seems to be distinctly in the form of lumbar spondylosis and disc space narrowing with or without osteophytes in women may be a risk factor for low back pain. Uh, what are the characteristics of uh, or the clinical presentation? Uh, see, there will be pain definitely because, as I said, degenerative changes and the subchondral bone is exposed. The location of degenerative changes is not surprising as nociceptive pain generators and uh, they are identified within the facet joints where there is the intervertebral discs and sacroiliac joints, nerve, root, dura, and also the myofascial structures. So these are the structures which are uh, involved and these changes may peak in different uh, clinical presentations such as spinal stenosis, disc herniation, bulging of the ligament of phlebum, spondylolistasis and so on. Patients suffering from lumbar spondylosis may have neurological claudication, I told you before, which includes low back pain, leg pain, numbness, while standing and walking, and this improve in sitting and in supine position or when they bend, because ultimately there is the narrowing of the canal. The pedicle anteroposterior dimension, obliquity and the relative intraarticular process interpedicle dimensions are also important osteological determinants of the presence and the size of the lateral recesses at different vertebral lumbar levels. The osteoligamentous nerve root canals and their terminal intervertebral canals show significant normal narrowing at the level of the opposed intervertebral disc and the facet joint capsules. This narrowing causes a grain-like appearance in the normal nerve root canals of the appearance of long neck gouts in the osteoligamentous intervertebral canals. So this narrowing of the discs is an important cause of the many degenerative changes that we see in the lumbar spine. Now, what are the other conditions that may uh, superimpose or mimic? So, how to differentiate them? So, when a patient is suffering from back pain, there are a lot of possible pathologies. So, along with the lumbar spondylosis, there are other causes such uh, as we can see rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, some clinici clinicians would include RA because of subdivisions of lumbar spondylosis has a lot of similarities to arthritis. Minor back trauma can be the cause of degenerative pathologies such as spondylosis. Then we have excessive exercise, too much of weightlifting, too much of exercises, aggressive exercise, back strain, then uh, bacterial disease that is the AS ankylosing spondylitis, the, the bamboo spine where there is a fused spine, fused vertebral column. Then you have the coccyx pain, we have the spinal masses, infection, disc herniation, discitis, lumbar compression fractures, degenerative disc disease, facial arthropathy, mechanical low back pain due to, due to improper posture, faulty habits, or occupational hazards. This is the this is the dearrangement or the malalignment of the vertebral column will lead to mechanical low back pain, overuse and injury. Overuse injury is also one of the very important cause. So, diagnostic procedures, uh, we go for an MRI, X-ray, CT inspect, uh, but uh, uh, X-ray is the most accessible and uh, uh, cost effective that uh, uh, patients can easily access and there we can see the bone spurs on the vertebral bodies very clearly thickening of facet joints and the narrowing of the intervertebral disc spaces but if you can go for MRI it's a little bit expensive than X-ray but it shows greater details in the spine used to visualize the intervertebral disc the degree of disc herniation and also it is able to visualize the vertebrae the facet joint nerves ligaments in the spine and can reliably diagnose a pinched nerve or an impinged nerve. CT scan is able to visualize the spine in great detail and can diagnose narrowing of the spinal canal stenosis when it is present. SPECT single photon emission computed tomography, bone scintigraphy are used to further evaluate patients with suspected spondylolysis or controversy surrounds the designation of these tests as most useful in the evaluation of spondylosis. It is important that the diagnostic procedures are only ordered or taken when 
warranted. That means if for a simple low back pain with no red flags, a conservative approach in cooperating pain medication and physio should be taken in the acute stage. When the chronic pain is present, diagnostic tools should be considered. So this is important for us to keep in mind that uh, we uh, those who have back pain we like to cannot think of immediately all the patients to send to the MRI or the x-ray uh, we should first see what is the stage is there the red flex present or not uh, what are the um, history a proper history of the patient will give you the exact it will help you the assessment so we as physios has to be very much uh, alert in this uh, assessment taking procedures then these procedures were validated in several studies which concluded that mri 92 percent sensitivity is effective in identifying pars arti uh, interarticular lesions ct scan was also used as a diagnostic procedure but the result weren't equally positive that is why mri is advised at the best method of diagnosis now if you go to the outcome measures then we have a number of scales and pain rating scales like the numeric pain rating scale and prs patient is asked to score three pain rating worst current best over the last 24 hours the score for this scale is the average of these three values the worst current and the best over the last 24 hours the scale is a variant of the vas but also access pain intensity the Roland Morris Disability Questionnaire RMDQ contains sentences that people have used to describe themselves when they have back pain on that specific day. As the people read the list, they might recognize themselves and they must tick that box. A score is appointed according to the number of boxes the patient fills in. So this questionnaire makes it possible to follow changes in time. The Auspestry Disability Index or the revised ODI is made to evaluate how big back pain invalidates people in their daily activities or the interference in the daily activities like sleeping, self-care, sex life, social life, traveling. Each question contains six categories, zero, no limitation, six, most limitation. So the score is calculated by the sum of the 10 questions and multiplied by two. The value represents the percentage of invalidity, invalidation. Then another is the PSEQ, Pain Self-Efficacy Questionnaire. It rates how confident patients feel performing activities despite the pain, the confidence. So this is indicated on a scale from zero, uh, no confidence to six, completely confident. All the scores then added up to a score from zero to 60, where the closer to 60 means that the patients have a strong self-efficacy belief. There are also shorter versions of the questionnaire available who shows also have a great responsiveness. Then the patient specific functional scale PSFS questionnaire where patients were asked to identify up to three activities that they had difficulty with or unable to perform as a result of their back pain. Each item is given a score of 0 to 10. And the total score is assessed by the sum of the activity scores by divided by the number of activities. And the minimum detectable change is 90% for average scores 2 points, minimum detectable change for single activity 3 points. Of all the questionnaires, the NRPS is recommended for assessing pain because of the ease of administration and the responsiveness. The ODI and the RMDQ are recommended for assessing functioning. Now we come to the examination. When a physical therapist performs an examination for lumbar spondylosis, it is advised to follow the principles of general spine examination, then apply them to the specific pathology. The examination should begin as you see the patient and continue with careful observation during the whole consultation, right from his gait and his posture, his uh, attitude of the limbs, the, the pelvis level, the shoulder level, the scapular level, his uh, 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 the clorotic curves or the Diaphotic curves of the spine. So, the general examination of the spine, inspection of the entire spine, swellings, any obvious swellings or surgical scars, assess for the deformity, scoliosis, scyphosis, loss of lumbar lordosis, hyperlordosis, and also for the shoulder asymmetry and pelvic tilt, as I have told you now. Pulpate for tenderness over the bone and soft tissues. We should perform an abdominal examination to identify any masses or consider a rectal examination to exclude other pathologies in the region. 
the movements we have to see the flexion the extension lateral flexion rotation if there is too much of pain in extension then we can think of that it is in the direction of stenosis and if the person flexes and bends and gets a relief that means there is some narrowing in the spinal canal and if there is some pain in the flexion or he cannot bend there may be there is a limited ROM in flexion there may be some disc or the nerve root impingement so also the radiculopathy has to be assessed there are radiating pains the uh, tests which will include the um, the SLR or the slum test uh, the tension test which we we provocate the um, symptoms by the uh, uh, by increasing the tension in the neurological structures and then neurovascular examination also the senses and tone power reflexes all the peripheral pulses should be checked as vascular claudication in the upper lower limbs can mimic symptoms of radiculopathy or canal stenosis in the management we can uh, broadly summarize into pain management physiotherapy and then surgery that is pain and physiotherapy will come into the conservative or the non-surgical and then if the things does not improve then or it is more, much more severe we go for the third category called the surgery then medical management pharmacological uh, we go for mainly the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs analgesics and it covers wide range of selectivity from the non-selective uh, cyclooxygenous inhibitors to the preferential COX-2 then you have the opioid medication as an alternative therapy for patients suffering from GI side effects due to a poor control of uh, NSIDS management patients who use this type of medication report greater distress suffering and higher functional disability scores then the antidepressants be used as a treatment of because of their analgesic value at low doses. The use of antidepressants has also been explored for their dual role in the treatment of depression that accompanies the lumbar spondylosis syndrome. Muscle relaxants may prove a benefit with regard to short term pain relief with overall functioning. Epidural steroid injections are common injections and target the epidural space, space surrounding the membrane that covers the spine and nerve roots. I have um, describe this epidural space in the basic uh, spinal anatomy video which I have uh, shared with you guys. So these are the strong anti-inflammatory combination of corticosteroid with a local anesthetic pain relief medicine and it is given as an immediate pain relief however there is a poor evidence for the effectiveness that is improvement in short term and long term benefits and safety of the epidural steroid injections for spinal stenosis. We have to see that. So the lumbar facet joint injections are uh, minimally invasive injections of medication, intra-articular injection of local anesthetics with or without steroid into the inflamed facet joints. This medication can temporarily relieve the back pain. It can be used as diagnostic test also as a treat or as a treatment to relieve inflammation and pain. We have the sacroiliac joint injections for treatment of sacroiliac joint pain consists of injections of local anesthetics and steroids, radiofrequency ablation of the joint capsule or radiofrequency neurotomy of the lumbar sacrolateral bunch nerves like the L5 and the S1, S3. No serious complications have been reported after SI joint injection. See all the conservative method if it does not work then we have to go for the surgical management. The lumbar fusion is generally used as a, when the conservative management has failed and the patient still suffers from the pain after 6 months. Two vertebrae are fused together which subsequently act like one solid vertebra and after 2 years the bony fusion can be considered high. So there are different types of lumbar fusions, anterior lumbar interbody fusions ALIF posterior lumbar interbody fusion PLIF and posterolateral fusion. Uh, the study of Lamley et al. 2014 about the anterior lumbar interbody fusion where they access the spine via the abdominal cavity has shown a significant decrease in blood loss, hospital stay and operative time. 5 to 10 percent of patients treated with surgery till still endure serious pain after for an example of lumbar uh, fusion electrical stimulation of the dorsal columns of the spinal cord therefore becomes popular second line technique like they call it besides the ALF there also exists TLIF and the 
it seems to have the same clinical outcomes as ALIF and it has been demonstrated uh, that early psychomotor therapy results in better outcome after the cognitive, cognitive behavioral training and motor relearning uh, than early exercise therapy after a lumbar fusion. Also, there is another procedure called the artificial disc replacement ADR. The artificial disc replacement is the replacement of the degenerated intervertebral disc with an artificial disc in people with degenerative disc disease DDD of the lumbar or the cervical that has been unresponsive to non-surgical treatments and that has lasted more than six months. Unlike spinal fusion, ADR preserves the movement of spine which is thought to reduce or prevent the development of adjacent segment degeneration. Additionally, additionally a bone graft is not required for ADR and this elevates complications that is it reduces complications including bone graft, donor site pain and pseudoarthrosis all these complications are not there. On the other hand not all patients who suffer from DDD are eligible for ADR. It is estimated that only 5% of patients who require surgery for DDD will be candidates for ADR. About the PD management, the physiotherapy, now we can see that uh, the conservative therapy uh, it can be divided into various exercise based and behavioral interventions like exercise therapy. Main conservative treatment approach for lumbar spondylosis therapy must include aerobic exercise, muscle strengthening, stretching. The exercise programs have to be of various intensity, duration, and frequency. Kumar et al. have concluded that. Core muscle strengthening exercises together with the strengthening of gluteus maximus and flexibility training of the lumbar spine is a very effective rehab approach for all patients with chronic low back pain. It is demonstrated that older adults with lumbar spondylosis have a more elevated quality of life and they have an abdominal strength. Then another is the traction. The lumbar traction helps to relieve the back pain. It opens up the intervertebral space and decreases spine lordosis. Temporary spine realignment relieves the mechanical stress. This is the theoretical concept and the nerve compressions, additions of the facet and the annulus and disrupts nociceptive pain signals. Nonetheless, uh, little is known about the risk factors associated with lumbar traction. Studies are still going on. The manual therapy. It is, it is a conservative treatment commonly involves like manual therapy more specifically spine manipulation even though the precise mechanism for improvement in low back pain remains unclear spine manipulation proves to be useful through in manual therapy with all the different kinds of mobilizations and the manipulations what we uh, try to do here he is if the case is an early case of degeneration or if the early changes of degeneration has takes place which has resulted in the mal alignment or the uh, wrong alignment of the vertebral column or the facet joints are you know in a, in a locked position or the discs are trying to bulge then some of these manual therapy techniques and the mobilization techniques are really very helpful which we bring the vertebral column back into alignment and also it helps in the disc resorption or the uh, recovery of the uh, these bulges which we have seen in many studies so depending on the patient condition the risk may be high or low but if manipulation is possible it is certainly used as treatment as shown by Redoc at all and it has a positive effect massage uh, therapy yes uh, sometimes it uh, is effective it appears to have a potential role in beneficial pain relief as you uh, as there is the degenerative changes and the there is uh, sometimes uh, a delay or a, um, you can say a restriction in the circulation or the waste products are not cleared it may accumulate there in the particular area where these changes are taking place so massage therapy uh, a kind of techniques like the effleurage and other techniques might be useful to uh, increase the circulation or to uh, release the uh, waste substances and subsequently 
relieving the pain. Then TENS is used, uh, it gives immediate reduction in pain symptoms following the therapy. Nevertheless, it remains little evidence of the long-term relief. Then patient education, patient awareness about the do's and don'ts, the explanation of the concept of the good posture, bad posture, ergonomics, all these things we have to educate the patient. <coughs> then the lumbar back support can be beneficial for patients suffering from LBP. It occurs to limit spine motion, stabilize and correct the deformity and reduce the mechanical forces. There is no consensus but if it may function as a placebo or really improves pain and functionality. Sitting decreases lumbar lordosis and increases disc pressure and squeezing on the skium and muscle activity in the lower back. <coughs> Excuse me. So these are all associated with low back pain. The study of Macosas et al. resulted in a diminished lumbar spine load and lumbar muscular activity with lumbar back support, which may possibly lessen the low back pain while sitting. <coughs> Excuse me. So Another set of exercises developed by McKenzie, very much popular uh, exercises concept which we use for LVP or low back pain is this method focuses on extension and it has a promising results concerning the prevention of further degeneration of the lumbar spine and uh, it has a particular concept and uh, we will not go into details of the principles of the McKenzie but these exercises are very much promising and good exercises uh, for the lumbar extension and the uh, sometimes disc bulge and disc herniations they do result give positive result and decrease in pain and also decrease in the stability for low back pain <coughs> compared with the other treatments such as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs educational booklet back massage and back care advice strength training supervision with supervision and spinal mobilization these mckenzie exercises are much more effective and then tipping is another non-surgical management because of the malalignment of the vertebral column since the ligaments and the muscles are attached there because of the malalignment there will be also malalignment in the uh, in the muscles there some muscles might become tight some might become loose there may be a group of muscles becoming tight and spastic and some muscles uh, too much of stretch and lose lose the tone so we have to correct the position and we have to uh, support the muscle with uh, with our tipping um, so it gives a lot of uh, support and uh, it is an effective management uh, non-surgical management a lot of studies have shown that it helps to relieve pain sorry the pain uh, could be standard tape or kinesio tape there is no difference between the tips. It is important to note that tapping alone is not enough, but it should be used during the therapy as an uh, uh, as a part of the therapy to improve the range of motion. Then is the lumbar uh, support. With the help of braces uh, used for stabilization, reducing mechanical forces, they produce limit the spine motion and correct deformity. There is limited evidence-based research available but about the efficacy of the lumbar supports regarding patient improvement and functional ability to go back to work. An example is of a brace for lum brace, lumbar brace, the Leon antikyphosis brace. These are some of the x-rays and the pictures which you can go through. This is the uh, lumbar spondylosis x-ray where you can see the bony changes. Then this is the narrowed space, the osteophytes. These are some of the surgical procedures, lumbar lam laminectomy, which are done. This is the x-ray showing the spur bones, projections, narrowing of disc. So yes, uh, students, I think we have covered almost many uh, conditions of the spine including the PIVD, the stenosis, the listhesis, spondylitis, uh, spondylosis uh, and then one small area is the spondylolysis which I will be discussing very soon. So a few of the references you can go through and uh, any doubts uh, I'm, I'll be very much glad to help you guys with your doubts. Do come with your doubts, then discuss in the forum in the Google Classroom or in WhatsApp. Um, I hope this video and this lecture will definitely help you in understanding the lumbar spondylosis. Uh, thank you so much.